the all-new Dexcom G7. Continuous glucose monitor. Blood glucose monitor. CGM's work by... Continuous glucose monitor. All right, there's something that I have to show you. This box contains something called a CGM or a continuous glucose monitor. In the past, these were mainly used by people with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Now there's this growing market for non-diabetic users like me. This market is made up of people that are interested in the relationship between blood sugar and diet, exercise, and sleep. Wearing this little device taught me so much about blood sugar. Here's what I learned. Before we go any further, here's a crash course on blood sugar. Now, if you're an expert on blood sugar, feel free to skip ahead. But if you're new to this, like I was, then bear with me. When I first started learning about blood sugar, I was a bit overwhelmed. All these big words get thrown around. Hemoglobin A1C, hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, milligrams per deciliter, the list goes on. It all may sound like stuff that you learned in high school chemistry and then completely forgot as soon as the class was over. But when you dig down a little bit, it's not too bad. Blood sugar is usually expressed in milligrams per deciliter. Here's what that means. In one liter, there are 10 deciliters. So in this two liter bottle of Coke, there are 20 deciliters. In one gram, there are a thousand milligrams. A two liter bottle of Coke has roughly 234 grams of sugar. If you convert that to milligrams, that's 234,000 milligrams of sugar. Let's express the sugar content of this bottle of Coke in milligrams per deciliter. In this case, that's 234,000 divided by 20. When you simplify that number, it comes out to 11,700 milligrams per deciliter. Obviously, blood sugar is a little bit different than the sugar found in Coke, but hopefully this gives you an idea about what the language around blood sugar measurement actually means. Now let's take a look at what different ranges of blood sugar mean. Normal blood sugar is anything less than 117 milligrams per deciliter. If you average between 117 and 137 milligrams per deciliter, then you qualify as being pre-diabetic. If your average blood glucose is above 137 milligrams per deciliter, then you have diabetes. As we've discussed in some other videos, if you don't have diabetes, one of your main goals should be to avoid getting diabetes. Another term that gets thrown around a lot when talking about blood sugar is HbA1c or hemoglobin A1c. HbA1c is a way to measure how much sugar or glucose is stuck to the hemoglobin in your red blood cells. Here's why we care about that number. By knowing someone's HbA1c, we can estimate what their average blood glucose was over the past three months. If your HbA1c is less than 5.7%, then your average blood sugar is likely less than 117 milligrams per deciliter, which makes you non-diabetic. If HbA1c is between 5.7 and 6.4%, then you are likely in the pre-diabetic range. Having an HbA1c over 6.4% means that your average blood glucose is probably over 137 milligrams per deciliter, which would mean you have diabetes. If you don't have diabetes and you're not on track to having diabetes, you might be wondering why should I care? Well, high blood glucose variability is associated with disease and death even in non-diabetics. According to Dr. Peter Atia, prospective studies show that higher glucose variability in non-diabetics is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, frailty, cardiovascular death, cancer death, and death from any cause compared to lower glucose variability. So if your blood glucose looks like this on the average day, then you're pretty much at higher risk for all the major causes of death than someone whose blood glucose looks like this. If you wanna live a longer and better life like I do, then it's important to pay attention to blood glucose variability and try to reduce that variability as much as you can. Wearing a CGM taught me many things. When I got it, my main goal was to look for insights that would help drive behavior change. Andrew from a few months ago knew that Reese's peanut butter cups were not good for him. What that previous version of me didn't understand is how eating a Reese's peanut butter cup affected him in real time. Over the past year, I've been trying to permanently change my relationship with food. For most of my life, I saw food as a reward or as a way to change how I was feeling. If I was tired from all the studying or work I've been doing at college, then I would drive to the local coffee shop and buy an iced oat milk latte. If it had been an especially long or stressful day, I would reward myself with a few scoops of ice cream or some mozzarella cheese sticks. For me, the problem was as you grow older, you have more responsibilities and more stress, so you reward yourself more, and then pretty soon you got some unhealthy habits. Unfortunately, the relationship with food that I had doesn't lead anywhere good. Wearing the CGM gave me evidence of this in real time. If I ate a Reese's, then I could literally watch my blood sugar spike and then crash back down again. For me, wearing the CGM gave me evidence saying, hey, the food that you put in your body plays a huge role in how you feel and relate to the world around you. If you want to get the most out of life, you need to change your relationship with food. If you've been following my journey on this channel, then you know that I recently spent 75 days on Brian Johnson's Blueprint Diet. This diet has virtually no added sugar in it. I decided to wear the continuous glucose monitor 
for the final five days on Brian Johnson's diet and then compare that to two days of eating whatever I wanted. I then spent three days testing recipes for my new diet to see how they impacted my blood glucose levels. The results were fascinating. Here's what my blood glucose looked like on the average day doing Brian Johnson's diet. While on Brian's diet, my average fasted blood sugar was 96 milligrams per deciliter. The highest my blood sugar went was 125.6 milligrams per deciliter. And the lowest my blood sugar went was 91.3 milligrams per deciliter. For those of you interested, my HbA1c was 4.8%. As you can see, there's no huge spikes and then crashes. It's relatively stable throughout the day. Now let's look at my blood sugar from the first day I was off the Blueprint diet. Before we look at the data, let's talk a bit about what I ate during that first cheat day. To preface things, I just want to say I don't recommend that anyone eats like this. I did this for science and to further our understanding of the relationship between food and blood glucose. The day after Blueprint, I woke up and had a Greek yogurt with a ton of added sugar. Then I went to my favorite Mexican restaurant, ate a basket of chips, and devoured a massive queso-laden burrito. From there, I had a bag full of mini Reese's and a little Debbie Cosmic Brownie. Just a reminder, this was to further our understanding of the relationship between food and blood sugar. To wash it all down, I had a fruit juice that I mistakenly thought would not spike my blood sugar again. It turns out watermelon has a lot of sucrose in it, so that spiked my blood sugar as well. All this processed madness had me feeling like absolute garbage. Here's what my blood sugar looked like throughout the day. Now let's overlay this graph on top of the graph from the Blueprint diet. There you can see that nice little yogurt spike. There's the chips and burrito, Reese's, brownie, fruit juice, me feeling like garbage, get the picture. What's crazy is that you can literally see the sugar rush and then the sugar crash. Some of you may be wondering, was it worth it? Yes. No, no, I felt so sick. If you've been following my journey on this channel, then you know that I'm off of Brian Johnson's diet and I'm on my own diet. My diet did take a lot of inspiration from Brian Johnson's diet. I just made it taste better and I added some more variety and more calories so that I'm not suppressing my hormones at age 23. When designing the diet, one of the goals was to optimize it for stable blood glucose levels. Using the CGM, I was able to dial things in and produce really similar results to the Blueprint diet. If you wanna know more about what the new diet looks like, leave me a comment down below. You may be asking yourself, how can I get a CGM and test this stuff for myself? The good news is there are tons of companies that you can go through to get one. Levels, NutriSense, and Vary are all examples. To get a CGM in the US, you need a prescription and these companies will handle that prescription for you. What's really cool though, is that in a few years, you won't need a CGM to get continuous readings of your blood glucose. Apple is reportedly working on non-invasive blood glucose monitoring for the Apple Watch. In fact, there are already some smartwatch companies out there that are producing products that claim to measure your blood glucose. From what I've seen, it seems like the tech on market now just isn't that accurate but in a few years, it could be pretty good. I feel like it would be like scales that give you your body fat percentage or like heart rate monitors on your wrist. They're pretty good and they're getting better, but if you wanted really accurate data, then you would still wanna get a CGM or go get lab work done. When trying to make lasting change in your life, it's important to understand why you should make that change. And that's exactly what the CGM helped me do. If you enjoy these videos and learning along with me, it would mean so much if you left me a comment and made sure to subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.